Okay, so I guess I can start. Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Alex Heber, and I'm the chair of the SIPSERT COVID-19 Task Force. And I'd like to welcome you today to the SIPSERT COVID-19 Readiness Resource Project Virtual Town Hall Series. This is our 12th virtual town hall presented in support of our Canadian public safety personnel who are working through and dealing with issues related to COVID-19 pandemic. I have a few housekeeping items just before we begin, and they should appear on the slide. Okay, all attendees, you are in listen-only mode. This is to limit uh, the ambient noise and feedback during the presentations. And today's session is being recorded. A copy of the recording will be sent out to everyone um, who's registered uh, within 20, or sorry, within 48 hours. Please use the question box to ask questions throughout the presentation and we'll have a question and answer period. Also today, to make this a more active, interactive presentation, we will be conducting online polls throughout the presentation and we ask you to please respond as quickly as possible to the questions when they appear on your screen and we will post the results of the polls as soon as we can also on the screen. So we thought that would make it a bit more interesting. Okay, some organizations block the GoToWebinar launch window. This means you may have to join us by phone if you're having trouble hearing or viewing the session and I'm sorry for that if that happens. Okay, our topic today is Wellness Together Canada, basic mental health care your way when you want it. And um, I am very pleased to introduce today's presenters. First, we have Dr. Peter Cornish, who is an honorary research professor at Memorial University and the Director of Counseling and Psychological Services at the University of California, Berkeley. His clinical and research interests include online mental health, stepped care treatments, mental health service innovations, and interprofessional team functioning. Over the past five years, he has provided consultation and on-site training on his stepped care 2.0 model to over 150 organizations across North America. His nonprofit company, Stepped Care Solutions, is the lead partner in Wellness Together Canada, a federal COVID-19 $70 million mental health program for all Canadians. He is the principal investigator for a $1.14 million CIHR Transitions in Care four-year research grant aimed at digitizing and evaluating Stepped Care 2.0 across two Atlantic provinces. Currently, he is collaborating with colleagues on a three book series on Stepped Care 2.0 to be published by Springer with the first in the series available now. And our second presenter is Dr. Anne-Marie Mitchell, uh, sorry, I'm so sorry, Dr. Anne-Marie Churchill, and she is executive director for Stepped Care Solutions on the Wellness Together Canada project. Anne-Marie is a research fellow at Memorial University working on a CIHR pragmatic trial, uh, digitizing stepped mental health care. Anne-Marie has 30 years of direct clinical experience specializing in anxiety and trauma treatment and resilience development. Development. And so I'd like to thank you both. And I believe, Peter, you're going to start. Thank you very much. Uh, it, uh, I had to remind myself to unmute, so that's done. Um, it's, it's a delight to be here, um, uh, both Anne Marie and I. And what we, as, as the title suggests, um, your way when you want it. And we, 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 we tried to figure out if there's a way that we can make this webinar uh, interactive so it can be for you your way um, and you know only a few steps along that uh, path that we could take because of uh, the complication of having a large group and, and making it interactive. But as um, as Alex mentioned, one way is, is, is to get a poll in. So we thought we would start this by asking a little bit to, uh, to get to know a little bit more about you on the line um, before we start telling you about this project, because maybe you know all kinds of things about it already. So, um, so the first state, uh, 
hang on, it's not queuing here. The first uh, poll, um, this is a queue now for that to come up. I think my screen will disappear and you'll get a chance to, to answer the questions. Now, is that happening on your screens, anybody? Yeah, uh, the first question is, have you had experience with some time type of online mental health programming? Yes or no? Perfect. Okay, are so you putting up? Sorry, the results popped up for uh, for a minute there. The uh, yeah. I'm just, the answer is a thirty four percent said yes, sixty six percent said no. Okay, so that's the first one. Uh, now we're going to do the second. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. So for people who have used it, how helpful was it? And you have a few options. Very helpful, somewhat helpful, neutral, somewhat unhelpful, or very unhelpful. Okay, so our results are 22% found it very helpful, 44% found it somewhat helpful, 33% are neutral, and nobody indicated that they found it unhelpful. Okay, great. Well, thank you for, for, for sharing that with us. That's actually um, more than I would have expected um, that people have, have tried this because uh, our, our assumptions have been that this is very new. So um, that's, that's good to know. So. The, the, what we're going to um, do today is give you a little bit of um, information about what Step Care 2.0 is. It's a it's a very different way of providing service. And at the end, we're going to ask you um, some questions about how appropriate you think this kind of program is for your uh, stakeholders and for you or for, for basically public safety personnel. Because it, we have a sort of running argument going on within our, our own organization whether a broad population-based um, program is is uh, appropriate or suitable um, or is is it really need to be specialized and some of my colleagues say oh it's always got to be specialized and 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 some of uh, the rest of us say well wait a minute that's a little bit stigmatizing assuming that public safety personnel need always need specialized treatment maybe they're just like the rest of us at, in many cases that just just need something quick that isn't necessarily directed specifically to their um, um, life, uh, professional life. Um, so we're not sure of that answer. Are you still seeing my screen? Is that, okay, good. Okay, so um, this is the front page of Wellness Together Canada, and in a few moments, um, Anne Marie's going to uh, do a demonstration, take you live to this uh, this portal, and show you what's uh, behind these the, the the landing page here. But this is what you see on the front page. Um, these shoes came up uh, th through a campaign, and I think it was in May where. Um, I think uh, the Minister of Health, as, as well as I think uh, uh, um, Sophie Trudeau, had a pair of shoes, and the idea was um, that you know you just need to take that step uh, on your mental health, and what that step is can look very different for everyone. Um, this whole model is meant to give lots of choice. It's not meant to be prescriptive. People can try out something, or the, it doesn't seem to work. They can try something else. Uh, so if you Scroll down on that front page, you'll see 
um, that the one part of this process involves uh, some metrics uh, where you can track how you're doing over time, kind of like a step counter. And we, uh, the whole point with this particular model of care is, is that this helps people to make a decision about whether they should try something else if it's not not working out too well. Um, and then if you if if you just want to go and talk to somebody and it's a crisis immediately uh, or you just want to go straight to a counselor then you can uh, you can jump into that uh, youth can go in one direction and adults in another so we'll come back to this in some more detail but I just wanted to give you the front page as a as a starter so now I just want to uh, get into a little bit of theory and sort of those of you that are bored by theory, you can multitask and <laughs> check your email. But um, these are these are sort of the features of this particular version of stepped care. There's lots of different ways of doing stepped care. We put the 2.0 in because it's quite different from the way it's been done in other places previously. One of the primary um, uh, d uh, differences is that it's in the hands of users to make decisions. Um, they can get expert opinions and help on making those decisions if they want it, but it's kind of like we first of all start by trusting that the person kind of knows, um, uh, might know what they want to try first. Um, and if we, we start by asking them to, to what, what do they want versus we're going to do a deep assessment and somehow magically come up with the best solution for you, we assessment is possible and is part of treatment in step care 2.0 but sometimes that becomes a barrier to treatment because somebody might encounter uh, a psychologist or uh, anywhere in an intake system and the first thing you have to do is fill out 15 forms you fill out the forms and then you're told to wait a long time and we're trying to get away from that let's just ask people what they want have it ready immediately um, something as simple and if that doesn't work we can go a little deeper so the options are based partly on what people are ready for. Um, studies show that 80% of people are not ready for psychotherapy, even though they have a mental health challenge. Well, why are we, uh, why is that what the first thing that we're offering? Um, there's a lot of simpler things that we might want to offer in a buffet um, so that people don't have to be ready to take on the challenge of therapy. Therapy can be a intimidating thing. And uh, often in our system, you have a couple of options. You have therapy or meds. Um, and what we're trying to do with, with Step Care and 2.0 is, is have a, a broader buffet. So before the pandemic, it of course included face-to-face <laughs> -face, uh, care. And, and that care is, is, is more than just with professionals. It's with peer support uh, as well. Um, and in, in the university setting that I'm now working in, I just had a discussion with our admin staff and they get they, they get trained to be part of the care too because um, often they have really good listening skills and if someone is uh, in a waiting room uncomfortable they might say hey look would you like to come to this room and if they're uh, crying or something like that you say hey do you want to talk about it a little bit and basically the idea with step care 2.0 is there's lots of people that can be part of the support system you don't always have to have the professional degrees behind them and then this the, the second part of this bullet of course is is our lives these day the, these days uh, online care we've actually before the pandemic i was always trying to convince my colleagues that online care works and people like it basically we've proven that now because we're getting lots of feedback that people find it um, uh, they have preferences, of course. Maybe some people still prefer to be in person, but what we're hearing almost unanimously is this is just as effective. Maybe it's not quite as comfortable, but it's just as effective. We start strong, start simple. It's strengths-based. Um, instead of asking people, what's, uh, all, tell me all the things that are wrong with you, uh, we really want to be clear that we're asking some of the things that are right with you. And I think this is particularly important for public safety personnel. Often they have uh, skills, um, uh, developed resilience over time. We want to we want to capture the strengths, want to maintain the strengths, build them up, as opposed to just tell me everything that's wrong with you. And the problem with asking about everything that's wrong with a person, uh, well, that can be useful if there's a diagnostic question we're trying to answer. Um, it sets the stage for a long, um, course of treatment if our goal is to fix everything that's wrong with you. So if I went in and did a deficit assessment, which most of our assessments are, there'd be a number of things wrong with me. But I don't know that I need those things fixed right now. Um, 
and so it, it kind of sometimes it changes the agenda uh, to what the, the the assessor thinks should be treated as opposed to what you're interested in in working on. The other thing that's that's unique about our approach is that we really encourage trial and error. It's it's actually a high bar, and it's a little bit dangerous to say we have to get it right the first time, because let's say you're waiting a long time to see a therapist. You've got one chance at this. You get the therapist, and it and it really isn't a good personality match. Then you have to wait a long time to get another one. Um, what we want to do is make sure that there's lots of different options people can try and then even with the therapist it's very easy if it's not a good fit to have a switch. Um, single session approaches can help with that. Uh, single session is a bit of a misnomer. Um, what we what we really mean by it is therapy one at a time, kind of like when you go to your GP. You go to your GP once, uh, they give you a, a prescription and they say you can come back if you're not feeling better. You know, do come back if you're not feeling better, but maybe one at a time uh, is just what you need right now. It doesn't mean you can't also get multiple sessions. The other thing that we look at is that session in psychotherapy, for example, doesn't always have to be 50 minutes. Um, and and it can and and but if we are going to do an intensive therapy, we want to make sure that people are ready for that, and that we don't offer that as a default. But often, just when wow, if it's this real sweet spot and this person's ready to take on the challenges of therapy, let's get them in there. If they're not ready for it, we'll go to where they are ready and give them something else, and that might be enough. Even though it's trauma, even though it's long-term uh, exposure to, to, to something very intense and traumatic, for some people, once is enough. So we don't want to assume that everybody needs intensive therapy. Another thing that we do is 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 that it's a collaborative approach, um, and 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 we know, especially with public safety personnel, the team you work on, um, they are your peers. They have can offer a lot of support, and risk for keeping somebody alive isn't in the hands of just a psychiatrist or a professional, but we try to make sure that it's the whole community that's um, taking care, it takes a village. And you, you, this group on this call probably knows that more than, um, more than anybody. Also talked about this a little bit, um, we try not to put the assessment up front uh, because it, it can be a barrier. We use it when we need to, but we do do monitoring. You saw me refer to the tracking that's sort of like tracking your steps. We put uh, this monitoring in so that you can change course if you're not getting what you need. It can help you to see what's working for you and, and, and what isn't. Allows that adjustment and, and that little picture reminds me of the equalizer. Uh, I don't know if we have equalizers anymore in audio systems because everybody just listens to their phone, so that's probably dating me. But uh, yeah, you can make adjustments to your care. Um, the final thing I think is most important, service user choice is maximized. Service users know what they, uh, and so what our job is to, is to help service users when they come to the portal or they come into a step care system to know what they can expect from the buffet of options. And then secondly, what's expected of them for each option? And sometimes we leave that out because for, for psychotherapy to work, you actually, you know, there's a, a certain amount of um, preparation you need to do. You need to be ready to kind of take that on. Or if you're working with a, in a peer support system, what's, you know, what, what are the risks for you? What, what's expected of you to make that work? If you're going to a therapy group, what's, what's um, involved in, and, and we sometimes don't explain that very well when we're offering options. And so we're working on doing that with this, this portal and, and, and other places where we're implementing. So this is a, a representation of the nine steps that are part of our step to care model. Uh, others have less steps. In, in a moment, you'll see one that was developed by um, Kyle Handley at the York Regional Police. He, he did a training with us at Memorial years ago, and, and he has an eight step version um, for um, police work. I don't know if it's, it's implemented fully, but this was the, con the concept you'll see in a few minutes from him. So I just wanna take, take you through the, uh, there's a lot on this slide, it's quite busy. Um, but the steps, the reason they're arranged like this is that if you look on the on the left hand, the green arrow going down, actually that's backwards. It should that arrow should be the other way around. So I apologize for that. Uh, what it means is that as you go up in the step um, uh, in the 
up the screen, uh, there's more expense, there's more time, there's perhaps more effort required on the part of the service user. Um, in the system, it costs a lot more to have hospital-based care or psychiatric care, or psychological care. And we really want all, all people to be aware of um, this idea of cost benefit. And, you know, if, it, why would we, um, what, why go to a hospital or go to a psychiatrist if it's not the thing that you're going to get the best outcome out of? Uh, and why should our systems be set up to send everybody to the most expensive care if, in fact, less expensive and less time demanding on, on the part of people that are very busy could be more effective? And this is where the monitoring comes in. So this isn't just a way to save money. It's a way to make sure that we're getting the best outcomes first for people and to show us where we should invest in our care development system. And what we're finding with Wellness Together Canada, and we're quite surprised by this, more people are interested in getting the lower intensity steps. So step one is really just information. It's like mental health literacy. It's just uh, uh, what, what, how to deal with stress. Um, it, basically just information. Step two becomes more interactive. It's like taking an online course. And so CB, there can be self-directed CBT care. I think uh, your folks might be aware of some of this in the PSP net system. That would be a, um, that would be a blend of, of, of step two and uh, three, because I think it has a peer support component as well in it. Um, so step three is what do we do to support and bring peer support in as a formal part of our care system. That means training peer supporters. That means giving family the resources they need to be part of the team, be part of the care system. Step four, these would be uh, workshops. So for example, this webinar is, is would be an example. Now we're doing this for an audience that isn't necessarily seeking care, but this might be uh, workshops on depression or trauma. Um, and it's like going to a class. And that's less intimidating, perhaps, than going uh, to see a therapist. And then step five is kind of in the middle. It's a bit of blended. You'll have some experts involved in um, a little bit of coaching while doing this online modules, self-managed modules. Then you check in with a therapist every once in a while, every week or so, um, and they guide the use of, of, of the self-help material. That's found to be the most effective of uh, the self-help uh, treatments. Um, self-help alone can work really well for some people who are, um, are, are uh, like working independently and don't need a coach, but other people you know, need, need a coach to keep going. When, when you're struggling with something like depression or anxiety, it, sometimes it helps to have somebody nudge you a bit. And, and, but that's, that's uh, um, up to the person, whether they feel like they need that coach or they wanna do it themselves. Uh, and then the upper steps are, are more um, familiar, I think, as part of our current provincial territorial system. Intensive group therapy uh, for trauma is, is, is a, a, a very um, um, effective kind of treatment because not only are you working on yourself, but you're in a community in the room helping other people too. And that bi-directional where you're not just receiving help is a little more empowering. And, uh, but if that's not something people are comfortable with, because there's a high exposure when you have to reveal yourself to others, then of course you can do the one-on-one -on -one, uh, therapy. With, with 2.0, we try to make that more flexible than it is in our traditional system so that therapists don't have to necessarily be tied to 50 minute hour. They can, they, they can do it a one at a time and people can come back whenever they want. Like, going to your physician, or you can do a course of therapy as well, but we're opening that up to make it more flexible. And then step eight uh, is, is involvement of psychiatry. And, and within step care, what you try to do is, is see if um, the psychiatrist's role might just be consulting with other providers. So maybe consulting with the physician and saying, look, I, you know, you, I, I know you've tried this uh, treatment with a few medications. Have you tried this combination? And so you don't necessarily have to have both a psychiatrist and a physician. The psychiatrist can help the physician. But if that doesn't work, you might step it up to ongoing care by a psychiatrist. But we don't necessarily always send you straight to the specialist if all your physician needs is a bit of help 
um, with, with getting a better treatment plan. And then step nine is when it's inpatient care um, and uh, uh, hospital-based, often wh where the care system falls down is it doesn't integrate well with the other, you know, it's a discharge or admission, there really isn't continuity of care. And so what we, what we try to do in here is build in a, a system at navigation and advocacy um, um, support, uh, and often peers can be involved at this level too. So when someone's discharged, they just don't go out into the void. I don't know, Alex, if there's any any chatter on the chat or questions that would be we might pause for at this point. What do you think? Give me a second to look. Okay. One of the things while you're looking, one of the things that I forgot to mention, you can see it on the slide, but uh, the idea with this is that people can get care immediately. Um, so through the portal, you can get care 24-7 by using the apps. Um, you can get same-day care by calling, um, uh, texting the crisis line. You'll see this when Anne-Marie takes you through, or you can get a, a, an immediate counseling session or multiple sessions. So it's open access means it's, it's when you want it, it's immediate, uh, and it's in several modalities. And you don't just get assessment. That's a, a, a real problem with many of our traditional programs is your first point of care, you actually walk away with nothing except uh, um, maybe a, um, some, some vague um, idea of when your appointment might be. Okay, Emily says there is no chat so far and I can't find any. So I think we do okay. not have any questions yet. Okay. So um, one of the problems we have with our current system is that we, we, we have a big um, demand. So if you think of the COVID problem, the whole reason we're wearing masks is to flatten the curve because the, it's, it's, a, it's an access problem for treatment. Um, we, may, we may prevent some people from ever getting COVID. I don't know, my personal feeling is we're probably all gonna get it at some point, but what flattening the curve means is that we're all, all, not all lining up and cramming into the hospitals at the same time. And, and so uh, a similar problem exists with mental health where um, we assess people, ask everything that's wrong with them and make them line up for step seven or eight. There's a long lineup um, and nobody gets care. So the curve is really high and it's really crowded in those rooms. And uh, one of our goals is to see, let's try an open up care, uh, simpler care that's 24 seven and see if that frees up the upper steps so that people who really need that and that lower won't work, they'll actually have much more access. And we're finding as we've implemented in provinces in Newfoundland and uh, we're now doing in Northwest Territories and soon in Nova Scotia, and we've done it a lot in post-secondary institutions. It in fact, that's what it does. It frees up the upper level care to provide, uh, to, sh to shorten those wait times to almost zero um, because what we've inadvertently done is we've sent everybody to that level um, and then we try to step them down when they don't need it and what we're thinking is why don't we just try the simple first and step them up if needed. So this is a, um, a, a, a version that uh, the York uh, Police Department, I don't know if they implemented but it certainly was part of at a conceptual stage uh, of, of how they linked this model to the road to mental uh, readiness mental health continuum um, so that you're you know you're, you're you're organizing your options in terms of where people are in the operational stress injury um, continuum and so as you can see you can you can arrange these steps according to uh, the intensity of the injury Okay, so this is the cue now to go to Anne-Marie, I think, to share, to actually do a demonstration on the portal. So uh, this screen will disappear, I think. Do I have to stop sharing? I have, oh. I have one question, by the okay, way. Okay, before we go, yeah. Okay, so the question is, do you have research or evidence that shows individuals prefer starting with step one slash self-directed care? 
That's an excellent question. So the answer is actually, um, let me clarify, that they don't have to start with that. So, so there's, diff there's different versions of stepped care. The, the original UK one was a progressive model, which was very rigid and said, we won't give you anything until you try this simple one. So, in, it, so whether there's research or not, we don't even go there because what our view is, um, and there's research, there's a lot of research that suggests that start with preference, start with what people, um, when you give them the options, what do they trust them? What do they want to try first? There's a lot of research that says that preference, giving people options. Now, sometimes people don't know, right? And that's fair enough. And that's when we might step in and do a, an interview and more assessment to help guide their decision. But you start with what people want. So they can go straight to step seven. They can go wherever, you know, in this model, you can go straight straight to what you want and it's interesting what we're learning is when you give people the full options and say what do you want what we're learning on wellness together canada at least 50 percent choose self-guided the lower steps the step one and two um, and that's just with people choosing on their own and we do have evidence that lower intensity options are actually effective but not for everybody, you know. It's it's no no one size fits all. And so the shoe the shoe the shoe analogy can be taken taken here a little bit too. It's like yeah, you, know, you got to get the right size, and maybe you don't like that color. That's a pretty wild looking shoe there. Yeah, a lot about what people are looking for and what they're ready to do or want to do. Um, can I share my screen now? Yeah, we're seeing it. I think. Are you? Or. Or is that my screen? Or maybe it's my, do I have to unshare? Uh, yes, I think you have to pass it over to Anne-Marie. Okay, so. No. Uh, no? I've passed it over to Anne-Marie. She should be good. That should be her screen that we're seeing, I okay. believe. Okay, yeah, well, you'll tell now when I sign in, yeah. Uh, okay. We're seeing the front page. You are seeing the front page? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just trying to get rid of the control panel so I can, you know. There should be a minimize here, is it? Yeah, I can drop it. Okay. Now you can see the Wellness Together Canada homepage. Um, up in the very top banner, and you'll see this both in the header and the footer, is this in need of immediate crisis support. And when people click here, um, you can see that the crisis text lines are available for people. Um, they're prompted to 911 if they feel there's immediate danger. And they can also find a number for the Indigenous um, People's Hope for, Hellness, Help, Hope for Wellness line. And they also now also have a chat line that's going to be included in the portal. So that um, call to action here for anybody feeling they need immediate crisis support, as I mentioned, it's provided throughout the portal. If we just come down to the next banner, you'll notice there's a toggle for French and English. Um, in our About section, so one of the things about this portal is it's iterative, and so is StepCare 2.0. So we believe in this um, component of and principle of continuous improvement based on feedback from users, um, stakeholders. So we have a number of working groups, and we have a number of ways for people to provide feedback to us. And one of the things people were asking a lot about is, do I have the sign in? What do I get if um, I don't sign in? Uh, who's doing this? So we created this about page um, that explains about Wellness Together Canada, who's behind it, who's supporting it. And these frequently asked questions were actually created um, by our group with lived experience, expert experience. Um, they actually filled out these questions for us and said they were the most um, helpful kinds of topics to address at this point. And then there's also an opportunity for people to provide um, information for other um, questions they might like to add to that. Okay. Trying to go back. portal okay so if we go back on the portal again um, that's the about and then the supporters are people who are supporting the portal and you have an option to sign in or get started so I already have an account so um, we'll start with the get started this is the call to action for people and when they click on get started what they'll see is a very simple sign up so we ask very little questions 
Um, and that's done purposely because we want to create as few barriers and friction as possible. And we know people are often reticent with giving personal information. So we simply ask people to create an account with their name and email um, so that they can be prompted um, for assessments, but also so that they can keep track of how they're doing um, and also uh, be able to watch their progress over time. Um, so that when they create that account, they can sign back in, they can go back into programming that they're using, and they can also get a personalized tracking of their wellness. Welcome and back that to that in your mind. <laughs> that information doesn't go to any clinician. It's de-identified. Um, so it is that often the answer to the question, who has my data, it's your data. Um, and, and so it is hosted on a website, but it's, it's de-identified and only, only the user gets the data. Yeah, so this is asked a lot. So who has access to my personal information? And we explain that the information provides to you, just it's your information, um, Green Space Health, all that information, and you can delete it at any time. And there's a Green Space Privacy Policy that explains it's not shared with any third parties and that the data belongs to you. And at any, any point you can unsubscribe. We're really helping people understand here what's available, that it's 24-7, there's no fees, it's for everybody across Canada, it's available in French and English, and then there's the call to action to take that step. And we've done this purposely to really simplify the portal to help either people either set up their account um, or to find out what's in the portal. And this goes to the preference piece, is what are you interested in? So what we heard from people is they're not sure what sign up means, they're not sure what they can get from sign up, what they can get outside of sign up. So we've actually created this program navigator. And this is a team of people at home with health. And when you call this number, they've been trained just on the portal um, in particular. So they're not providing a counseling service. They're actually providing a navigation service for the portal. So what they've been really asked to do is help people try to identify what would fit for them. So do you like to do things on your own? Would you rather speak to a counselor? Do you need an emergency service right away? So it's somebody that they can speak to immediately to help them navigate the portal. And also these people can explain what each of the programs are about. So people to choose to do self-guided or join a community of support or access counseling, they can explain how all of that works for them. So that program navigator is available 24 seven. Um, and again, if people choose to take the first step, that's the sign up. Um, this is what Peter mentioned. This explains what they actually get with sign up, they get their self-assessment, their health metrics, they track how they do can get self-guided courses and apps, can join a community of support, or they can get coaching, um, in particular on an anxiety program, but also on mindfulness, or they can access one-to-one -one counseling. And here again, when they click on take the first step, it's the sign up. And then they go into all of those resources. As the navigator will explain to some people, are, some people are still not ready to sign up and they're unsure if that's what they need, or maybe they just wanna to talk to somebody right away. So that's where they can get uh, any of those services here, if they click on adult resources, um, what it does is it goes to the Homewood Health page, which is one of our partners on the Wellness Together Canada site, and they're providing mental health counseling support, but also a whole lot of other resources. So if people want to go here, they can get free counseling immediately. Or what they can do is try out some of the resources. And what Homewood Health has done is they've curated some of their top resources they think would be useful during this pandemic. Um, and it's based on some of the calls they're getting. So things, um, mental health and addictions, um, understanding that whole addiction piece. A lot of people were asking for resources on substance use. And so Homewood Health have added these resources. You're gonna see in a minute, the Tau module has a substance use resource. Um, in addition, we're adding a program called Breaking Free. Um, and that'll be added in another two weeks, which is a specific substance use program. There's also resilience, building skills information, how to deal with financial stress, improving your relationship, um, anxiety, um, if, you're work, if you have someone in your life who's having a serious illness, um, and taking charge of stress. So what Homewood did, as I mentioned, is curate some of their main resources, um, and people can link to those immediately from, from the site. You can they, also don't have to, they don't have to sign up, because some people said sign up's a barrier, yeah. and what Step Care 2.0 is about let's take out all the barriers. When we heard from users, they found that a barrier 
we said, okay, you, you, you can go straight. Yeah, so that's a straight access to resources. And then if it's youth, they call on the youth and it goes to the um, kids' help phone resources. And they have a similar page built out um, with free counseling with their professional counselors and a whole suite of resources as well for youth. Um, and then there's also their immediate text lines again and the, and the prompt if you feel there's immediate danger to call 911 or crisis text line. Can, can you say something about the front line? There, because the, the, we just saw the front line text uh, so, line there. So we were asked to include this as well. This is um, uh, powered by Kids Help Phone, but they have a group of people who have been trained specifically to offer crisis support to frontline workers. And we've had other groups ask if we can do that here as well, and we certainly can. One of the things we're working on is developing a cultural competency model, and whether that's for public safety workers or whether that's for um, the nurses union or for frontline workers, all of these things are um, in discussion. And as each group comes forward, we ask to collaborate on what would be helpful um, for them to have on this portal. And what we're trying to decide, as Peter mentioned, and we'll have a discussion after, whether we keep it very much population health and everything on this portal can be useful to anybody across Canada or whether we want to do some more specific programming for specific groups. Currently, we have a population mental health approach where any one of these resources can be useful to people. And once again, as people stroll down, if they're not sure, they can call a program navigator. Anne-Marie, sorry, can I interrupt for one sec? Yes, please do. Uh I've got a couple more questions. I don't know if you want me to kind of interrupt you as we go along. Um, okay. I think yep. I think you kind of answered some of these already, but I'll just read them out to you. So one is who answers the text or call for immediate assistance? And the next one, which is kind of related, is what are the qualifications of the people answering? Yeah, that's a really good point. So at Homewood Health, these are professional counselors. And at Kids Help Phone, they have their volunteer crisis text line people. Um, but if it's something serious, then they will actually, that bumps up to a professional counselor. And they're all certified counselors. Some are social workers, some are certified with the Canadian Counseling Association, but they're all certified counselors in different regions across the country. Okay, and then I've got one more question so far. Is there a tool available to help people identify what might be their best starting step? I, ah, can, I can answer. Yeah, yeah go I can, That's interesting. I can yeah. answer that. So, so, um, no, <laughs> and we've been deliberate about that because, um, and and some of my colleagues will disagree with me on this, but when I look at the research and the literature on um, the and on how diagnosis informs treatment, it's not very solid, and so uh, rather than the first step being informed by diagnosis, which sometimes gets people to um, a high intensity care um, sooner than, uh, than they, they, they should, because they might not be ready for the high intensity care or it leads to over medication. What we prefer to take is let's just ask the person and trust the person to go with what they're asking for, see how well that works. And then if we're scratching our heads and it's not working, that's when we pull out our assessment and diagnostic tools. So we're really doing it backwards. And I know many of my colleagues, when they hear me say this, they say, oh my goodness, that's taking a big risk. What if you miss something and what we're finding is that the biggest uh, um, um, I guess the biggest contributor to risk is the barriers to access to care so even though it's well intentioned that we want to get everybody assessed up and down really really thoroughly so we don't miss something what that means is there's a huge wait time and we'll never be able to hire enough people to do that secondly when you start asking like I said earlier everybody what's wrong with them you're setting people up for a very negative um, sort of not sort of constructive way of working on their wellness. So Newfoundland is an example where this worked. Um, there was a rash of suicides in a small community in the Buren Peninsula and the experts, my colleagues and others said, oh, we got to get in there and start doing some screening and risk assessment to get the people who are at highest risk to, um, because there might be a contagion and it might get worse. The community members had been lobbying um, these are um, people with you know, lived experience, the, the, the wives of some of the men that died said, no, that's not what we want. We just want access to basic care from licensed counselors um, 
when we want. We want to walk in and get care. So the thinking now in the field, and this is new and not everybody agrees with us, is the better way to prevent a suicide is to stop privileging only those who have high symptoms and say anybody, whether you have high intensive symptoms or whether you don't, the best way to prevent a suicide is to make it as easy as going to your family physician. And I'm assuming you have a family physician in your community that you can go, you can get, you, and even better, you can go to the walk-in clinic and get care. Yeah, so I would say, Go, go ahead, and then I, I've got another question, Henry. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. That um, So although we're not doing full assessments at all and people get to choose the resource, we are helping people make informed decisions by them doing their own self-assessment. So when you mentioned, do we have any tools that can guide people to what resources they use, I think some people are using that self-assessment tool. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. But maybe, Alex, you want to go with the next question? Okay, so the next question is, where is the biggest gap when, it, oops, okay, hold on. Oh, we've got another one. Oh my gosh, now we've got lots of questions. Okay, good. Where, where is the biggest gap when it comes to mental health literacy? What types of, of information are individuals seeking? It's a great question. Well, we're, yeah, we're finding people are using a lot of the mental health literacy early intervention guides, the WellTrack program, the TAO, they all give information, and I'll show you in a minute, on um, not only what anxiety, depression, wellness looks like or doesn't look like, but also things that you can do to help yourself. So I find, in general, that that's been missing at a population level, that most people get help um, when their symptoms are pretty severe. And, and there's such basic things that people could be doing at a really early point that can offset some of those more severe symptoms or more severe cases. So I think that that's a, been a big gap in population health is disseminating what we do know um, about early onset symptoms and things people can do to offset those. I th yeah. But I think another gap is that most, a lot of our mental health literacy um, falls short because it only talks about things that are di diagnoses. So depression, um, post-traumatic stress, which are important things. But what's missing there is helping people to see what's the difference between a stress that makes sense and isn't something that's wrong with you inside you, isn't something that is a disease, but is something that is very, very important, but you don't have to self-stigmatize yourself with a diagnosis. Sometimes a diagnosis is the best way to not be stigmatized. You know, say, oh, well, I have this disease. And so what we really need to do is help sort out what is um, just a stressor that doesn't mean you need um, a sort of medical treatment um, versus what is something that that actually you got to get to uh, um, you got to get to care and and so the part that needs to be built out is um, helping people to figure out what's normal what's what's you know given your circumstances and then secondly uh, it's not just that you treat the deficits, but helping people to identify that some of the the strengths and capacities they have, they already have them, that they can use to cope with this, as opposed to you need to depend and ask an expert. That's where the gap is, helping people to yeah. sort that out. Yeah. And the, okay. the self-awareness piece. So mm -hmm. that's what we're going to move into with the scaling. But to recognize how you're doing on an ongoing basis. We've done a good job with people monitoring their physical health, but we really haven't done a good job with people monitoring their mental health. And that's really what we're trying to do through this portal as well. And this journey is for people to keep track of how they're doing. And when they notice it's not normal for them or something is actually changing for them, that they take some steps to use their strengths and capacities to increase their mental wellness. Okay, another quick question. You're gonna really like this question. Are retired first responders, frontline workers, eligible to access this resource and also family members? Everybody, everywhere in Canada and Canadians living abroad, all ages, all people anywhere in the country have access to this portal. But it isn't, what we're not doing is specialized treatment. So there's room for right. specialized treatment. Steps six through nine are very, very important parts of our care system. Operational stress injury clinics are equipped to deal with, you know, really severe um, uh, problems, suicidal behavior. And so we're not, we're not replacing that. 
that's it, but we, 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 what we see in the future is we want this to really connect well with those programs. We actually have a polling question that is sort of related to that. I wonder if, Henry, is there some, I know we haven't done the full demonstration. Is there something yeah, you wanted I mean, to? I, I think it would be useful to show the, um, the tracking and just one or two resources, just so people can see the depth of it. Um, and what they get. So when people sign in and they actually monitor their well-being over time, and you can sign up for this, whether you do it weekly or monthly or bi-monthly or bi-weekly, I've signed up for it to do it bi-weekly and you can get your results, which is in a graph, shows you if you're getting better or getting worse. Mine has dropped a bit here, which is probably because I haven't been exercising as much. So people can get personalized results. These come to me by email on how I'm doing. I filled out a basic uh, self-assessment on my mood, my well-being, and my functioning, and some of those how I'm doing well. Then I can decide if I want to do some self-guided tools, do I want to do this community of support, and this is based on the stepped care model, where these are the lowest intensity, the self-guided, um, that include things like a mindfulness program, well track, which is wonderful um, activities to minimize stress and anxiety and improve your wellness. And then the Tau modules, which there are quite a few of these that have activities and programming that people can do. Everything from um, general well being to a CBT program on calming your worry, improving your mood, um, evaluating your alcohol or drug use, interpersonal relationships, pain management recovery skills, and they're not just like one handout, there are a number of activities um, and modules that people actually work through. And this is the mental health literacy we were talking about, that this is the psychoeducational part about what is anxiety, and then what I can do about it. And there's like six modules in there that people can actually access each one of them and work at their own pace. But if they want to actually talk to people, um, they can choose this community of support, which is a chat room we're talking about maybe we could have some closed specialized groups here whether it is like veterans or nurses or public safety workers develop those groups right now it's just a general group and then strongest families out of Nova Scotia provide an anxiety program with a coach um, and then mindfulness you can actually drop in on a class um, a couple of times a week in French or English and we're adding more classes there as we go along and if people just say you know what I just want to talk to somebody, they can immediately click on get started um, with a counselor at Homewood. And these are professional counselors through that are used through Homewood Health Services, or they can use the Kids Help Phone Youth Line and connect with a professional counselor at Kids Help Phone. So there's a lot in the portal. As I mentioned, it's on a stepped care graded approach where people can choose to start with low intensity or go right to counseling, it's up to them. But it tries to give people choice and options and things that they can use over time and track if it's helping, track through their self-assessments. So as you mentioned, you have other questions and Peter, we have some polls. So I'll get out of this now. I don't know if I have to um, view back the screen. No, I think you'll be taken out. Uh, so show my screen. Uh, and uh, let's just see, yep, so you're seeing, uh, so in a moment you're going to get this poll, but I just want to introduce it. Um, so we're one of the things that we're um, faced with right now is this is a population-based program. It's it's made to be very very general, um, and it doesn't touch it. Not it wasn't designed for specialized groups, including um, public uh, public service uh, public safety personnel uh, or medical uh, frontline workers. Um, or um, specialized areas of, of mental health with pain, you know, even though there's some pain man management modules, we've, we're really not gearing this to um, particular uh, subpopulations with specialized needs. Having said that, we wonder if an exception should be made for uh, there's a lot of interest amongst Canadians pride in their public safety personnel and their veterans. Is there something that we should do on this portal that doesn't replace the amazing specialized work uh, that we don't have on this portal, but um, but but develop something specialized in steps one through five. So maybe let's go to the poll and see what you guys think if it's if it's clear what we're asking here. So does PSP programming belong on this general population site? And these are just yes, no, or uncertain.
Uh, we have 50% indicating yes, 6% indicating no, and 44% are uncertain. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Emily. Great. All right, next question. Would PSP want to separate more specialized site? And then that's yes, no, or uncertain. So we have 37% say yes, 11% say no, and 53% are uncertain. Okay. That's like us, join the club. We're uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> just, That's just what you do, trial and error. <laughs> just to remind you, we have about four minutes left. Yeah. Am I right, Emily? Yes. And we don't have anything else that we need to say um, after after this poll, but it, it, I'm, I'm curious about the last one, the last so, question. Yeah. <laughs> We'll launch the last poll then, and then you guys can finish up. One second. Yep. Do Canadians want to see that the federal government is supporting essential workers on Wellness Together Canada's site? And the three again are yes, no, or uncertain. Response is overwhelmingly yes at 89%, but 9% do say no and 3% are uncertain. Okay. Right. The majority do will say yes. Oh, thanks okay, for think, participating. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I don't know if, um, uh, Alex, if you want to go, uh, if there's anything else you want to say or, or if there's any more questions where we don't have anything else. I don't think there are any more questions. I couldn't see any more. Um, and I, for me, I just want to really give you a big thank you, Peter and Anne-Marie, for taking the time to do this presentation today. I think that this has been, it's certainly been helpful for me. I am going to get off this call and go on Wellness Together Canada. Sign up immediately. <laughs> and, and, tell us, assessment. <laughs> and tell us how to improve it because we've got, um, we are now working, we built this up, if everybody doesn't know this, over a week. So it's like very, very quick. So um, now we're working to make the user experience much better. So now's the time to say, hey, could you do this? Could you do that? Make it better here, it sucks in this area. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks to our audience for joining us today. Yeah, it's wonderful. Bye. Thanks, bye.